Welcome, London, to the new edition of Manish Tiwari Show. We have today with us in the studios a very distinguished personality, someone who I can possibly define uh, in, uh, in Nikesh Shukla's words as the good migrant, someone who I think uh, Preeti Patel, our Home Secretary, would be proud of, because this person has done his journey as a first-generation migrant, uh, has lived in different countries, has been in this country for the last 15, 20 years, started out in media and advertising, worked at different broadcasters, and today he is at Sky Broadcasting, which is UK's number one private broadcaster, and he looks after the diversity wing at Sky. Besides, he has his expertise in many different fields, and uh, he also is a very good speaker. Uh, he regularly blogs and has huge and varied interests from sports to culture. So, Dabashi Pandit, welcome to the Manish Tiwari Show. Hey, Manish, thank you so much uh, for uh, bringing me to your show and uh, to everybody, uh, wishing everyone a very happy Diwali, a happy prosperous new year, and uh, may this. Uh, New Year bring lots of peace, prosperity, and well-being to all our communities uh, worldwide. Thanks, Devashi. We very much need it. Happy Diwali to all our viewers. In these times of COVID, we definitely need the light as much as possible. So, uh, Devashi, uh, coming to our show, uh, welcome again. And uh, before we begin, I just want to inform the viewers that we might have a break in, uh, you know, six minutes. After which, we'll come back again. This show is about multiculturalism in London, in UK, and feel free to dial and ask any questions which you might have. Uh, again, just to reintroduce, Debashi looks after diversity in Sky UK, which is UK's number one private broadcaster. So, Debashi, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to make the most of uh, what what uh, the world is uh, has put us through, including uh, putting up with the beautiful, gorgeous uh, London weather, <laughs> which is <laughs> raining all day well, uh, since last night. Well, we had a very extended Indian summer. Uh, th this time, so we should not be complaining. But yes. uh, uh, Dabashi, so the first question which I wanted to ask you, um, you know, yeah. we both are first generation migrants and we both have kind of uh, lived through uh, the times which are like where media has kind of, you know, changed its form continuously. You know, it has kind of gone from the days when we were children, uh, when newspapers were like the, the supreme gods to a time when we are moving to a space which no one is, has got any clarity about. So my first question is, uh, you know, Sky UK, where, uh, you know, which broadcast channels like Ion TV uh, and many other channels, what do you think, you, you know, in terms of providing platform to multicultural channels like this, what do you think it has been its role? I mean, from whatever I know, uh, not very long back, UK never had a single multicultural channel. We only had BBC yeah. on Sundays broadcasting a one-hour segment on Asian culture and what's happening back home, which is India and Pakistan. Yeah? All right, sure. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, we, we might be having a break now, but uh, when we come back, we'll kind of take this first very important question, and I'd like to know your views on that. Hi, Dabashi, are you there? Hi. Yes, I am. Hi. Yeah. So what do you think has been the role and contribution of Sky as a broadcaster uh, in terms of making UK a multicultural and inclusive society? Where do you think, uh, you know, has Sky played a critical role in this? Oh, of course. I think uh, ever since uh, we were set up uh, as an organization, our focus always has been on a couple of things. One is bringing the best sporting action and entertainment uh, to our audiences. And secondly, and more importantly, uh, also looking at how we are able to serve our communities uh, with the various uh, programming that they uh, have been yearning for. Because uh, the world has changed a lot. Uh, but if you were to take a look, I think the first Asian channels came, joined onto the Sky platform probably at uh, the back end 
of uh, the, the last century, actually. <laughs> so with the millennium, I think there have been a lot of channels that have come in and they have not found any other place um, besides Sky uh, to have their uh, rightly found home. And what we as a broadcaster are also very particular about is looking at diversity and inclusion in all its forms and how we are better able to reflect society through the entertainment that we are able to provide our, our audiences. And that's the reason why I think there is a survey called the Bob Establishment Survey uh, that actually highlights that if you come from a black, Asian, minority ethnic background, there is a greater probability of you being a Sky subscriber than any other uh, provider in the market. So yeah, we, we take our job pretty seriously and I think we do a fairly good job on that one. Well, sure. Uh, but do you think that the channels which we have on Sky, uh, I'll make uh, South Asia, South Asian channels a reference point like Star TV, Sony TV, or for that matter, Ion TV. Do you think they do give credence and voice to South Asians living in this country? I mean, there are a lot of detractors who would say that uh, the, there's been a bit of cultural import. Say, for instance, there are channels uh, which are beamed in UK from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and uh, they, you know, the, the right wing has a point in saying that they might be culturally alienating or, uh, you know, disordering uh, South Asians or uh, the British, uh, you know, South Asian community from integrating or rather creating, uh, you know, is helping them create our own cultural ghetto. So that's, that's the right wing uh, kind of, you know, rebuttal towards yeah. uh, uh, what we have on uh, Skype. What do you think? I don't think so at all, uh, because of two factors. One is, uh, it's, it's, it's a free market, it's an open market. Now, if I were to uh, put, put my point of view across, all the channels that you mentioned exist here for a particular business reason. Nobody's doing any charity. And all of them are at least breaking even, if not making money. What does that say? Uh, that says that there is a yearning for this kind of content that comes from the audience itself. Now, it's very simple market dynamics that if there was no requirement for a content like this, then these channels wouldn't have probably existed in the first place because all of them would have been loss making, right? So the other point is, do you think any of the mainstream broadcasters are actually reflecting and understanding the cultural nuances that exist between these communities that you mentioned. Because had that been the case, then there would have been no requirement for these uh, specialist uh, South Asian or uh, you know ethnic channels to exist uh, because they wouldn't be able to serve a requirement that is already being fulfilled. The reason why they exist is because there is a huge appetite for the kind of programming content that these people yearn for. I mean, yes, uh, we do accept Channel 4, you know, once in a blue moon has a Bollywood season, but do you see Bollywood movies <laughs> regularly on any of the channels? No, right? Do you see any, uh, other than stereotyping uh, particular roles, uh, do you see uh, cast uh, or casting uh, of, of Asians uh, or, or a storyline being weaved around the dynamics that exist between, uh, you know, Asian lifestyles uh, being highlighted in any of the mainstream programs. I don't think that uh, that's, that's a correct objective. So I think it's very important to get the right sort of balance uh, because yes, you cannot be showing, uh, you know, programs which are probably from the heartlands of uh, the countries that we individually come from. Uh, because probably there's going to be no uh, uh, correlation or identifying yourself with that kind of a background. But if you were to take a look at the cities, uh, whether that's uh, the top cities of uh, India or Bangladesh or Pakistan or you know, Sri Lanka or any of these places, I think the lifestyle of the people who live in the cities is very much reflected in the lifestyle that a normal person living in the UK also has, right? So I think... Uh, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't agree with, the, with, the, with what the right wing has to say about uh, ghettoization, uh, but I think it's more of a simulation and the dual media behavior that exists of uh, various ethnic groups. 
Well, sure. I mean, you got very valid points, but uh, we've seen from time to time, uh, Ofcom has picked up on some of these channels, uh, and there has been reports in the media, uh, you know, that some of the media outlets uh, have used uh, this platform uh, to spread even hatred, or they have got, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, who have an agenda uh, using this medium uh, to spread uh, their own message, which is, uh, which possibly is kind of in a way uh, violating the code of conduct and possibly, uh, you know, making use of the fact that uh, uh, they are using religion sometimes to propagate a certain kind of uh, messaging. So there, there are certain issues, and uh, I'm not too sure if Ofcom has been able to successfully monitor and uh, manage that. Uh, on the other hand, yes, uh, you know, uh, you know the huge cultural diversity which South Asians have, you know, that needs to be reflected. So you got a very, very point. Yeah. No, no, absolutely, and I think I think it is the onus or the responsibility of us citizens uh, to uh, highlight extremism if uh, it exists in any shape or form and it is up to us to condemn it uh, whatever platform that we may be watching that extremist content uh, may be whether that's a youtube or whether that's a mainstream channel or whether that's any of the ethnic channels so uh, i think the onus lies on us uh, to be good uh, moral citizens and understand uh, as to where the line needs to be drawn and uh, how if you view or if you see any extremist content, you need to bring that down immediately. No questions asked. Uh, but I have a feeling that at least with the television industry, uh, there is Ofcom that is able to monitor all of that. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case uh, in the online platform, mm -hmm. where I think there's a far faster way and a more uh, dangerous way mm -hmm. of uh, of um, highlighting or showcasing extremist uh, content, uh, where I think uh, each platform owner uh, needs to take own responsibility to ensure that those things don't happen. Uh, but yeah, I do agree with you that if if there is any form of extremism that is being reflected in any of the channels, mm -hmm. uh, they need to be uh, called out uh, and 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 pulled down. Immediately. Sure. Now, the Bashi, I mean, uh, very interesting point that, uh, you know, Sky obviously is relaying content from different parts of the world. So, you know, we're able to see content in different languages. Uh, also, one of the things which, uh, you know, we all know is that uh, the Bengali community, and you being a Bengali, I just wanted to voice that out, uh, you know. Bengali community has a very special affection uh, with the language. Uh, Bangladesh is the only country in the world which celebrates International Day of Language with so much prominence, and it, it happens to be the National Day of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, yeah. So w what do you think? I mean, you know, I do consider that Bengal has been, uh, you know, f at the forefront of the Renaissance in India, the cultural Renaissance. Uh, it was one of those communities, uh, even before the partition, uh, which led all the major cultural revolutions in India, uh, reform yeah. movements, the in independence movement. So there, there's something special, and uh, because of that, you know, uh, Bengali language has kind of uh, been very rich. Uh, we all know that Tagore was possibly the first poet, among the first poet in non-English languages, who got the Nobel Prize for literature. That's right. So, yeah. where do you think uh, you know this affection for Bengali language, this whole kind of uh, love affair, and this kind of uh, you know, in a way, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm always astounded, or rather astonished, to see that there's so much Bengali media in this country, in the UK. Yeah. Even compared to, uh, let's say, you know, Hindi, which is like the most spoken language in in the subcontinent. There's a lot many more. There's at least seven newspapers uh, in Bengali published regularly from the United Kingdom. And seven is less. I mean, you know, the numbers used to be maybe 14 or 15. It has fallen down to seven. So, and there's so many TV channels. So what do you think is special about this relationship uh, with the Bengali language? A very good point. I think, I think Bengalis uh, are, are by birth a very proud um, culture. Uh, and, and, and they take pride in 
in all things Bengal. Uh, and I think, as you rightly highlighted, uh, if you were to take the history of uh, uh, of undivided India or, you know, uh, Bangladesh or Pakistan and India combined together when it was one whole country, um, you, will, you will not be surprised to find that many of the firsts uh, that have happened uh, have happened uh, by people from a Bengali uh, background and Bengali culture. And obviously that leads to a lot of pride of, of Bengalis, uh, you know, trying to live up to that, that high standard and high moral uh, that had been set by their, uh, you know, predecessors, uh, which, which, which is a great thing. And uh, also you've got to bear in mind that I think Bengali as a language is spoken by about 250 million people globally, uh, which is which is a huge number, and they are a proud bunch. Like I said, and there's a huge uh, diaspora uh, that that exists uh, all across the world. And uh, whatever said and done, like you said, because of these newspapers, because of the television channels, because of everything that exists, there is a natural affiliation for people to continue that tradition and pass that on down to generations, which again builds that that sense of pride and, and that sense of wanting to achieve something, uh, right? So Tagore is right up there because I don't think there has been any other uh, Bengali person uh, after Tagore who was, who's won the Nobel laureate, but um, Bengalis do strive uh, to do, do that. And, and I think there's also a lot of emphasis on education because Correct. naturally uh, compared to some other uh, you know, backgrounds or communities, uh, Bengalis don't tend to default into business. Uh, they tend to study and educate and probably they, uh, they, tr they try to pursue a more professional career path uh, rather than business, which is why probably you can count on your fingertips the number of businesses that are run by Bengalis there are there, uh, don't get me wrong, but I'm just talking about if you were to take a percentage-wise comparison, uh, a person from a Bengali background probably would be uh, at the bottom rung of somebody who starts a business compared to any other uh, community. So I think these are the multiple factors that exist uh, as a rationale uh, and also the pressure that you are brought up in, right? Because like you mentioned, all these names, uh, you know, Raja Ramon Roy or Vidya Sagar or, you know, Ed, uh, Tagore or, you know, uh, Bonkim Chandra or, you know, Vivekananda, all these people. Uh, right from birth, I mean, all these names have been ingrained uh, even in my head and I was told <laughs> to, to be... Uh, uh, as good as them, if not better. Uh, probably I failed on all those uh, on those <laughs> all those fronts, but uh, nevertheless, I think the pressure is there because of uh, you know your your upbringing. So and that obviously brings across a pride. Well, Debashi, you still have a long time to go, so I'm sure you can live up to those. <laughs> <laughs> very those kind of you, Manish. Very kind. <laughs> uh, yeah, but a very interesting point you made. Uh, that, you know, because there is some report which says that uh, the British curry houses, which were started by first-generation uh, Bengali migrants, uh, a, yeah. a lot of them face this challenge that the children have been uh, highly educated and they have moved on to do different things in life, and a lot of them yeah. are at risk of either closing down. Uh, due to the lack of movement from Bangladesh. I mean, there's a, there's a cap on how many people can come uh, as chef. Yeah. So there, there's a serious risk because there's a huge upward migration. So that kind of yeah. validates what you're saying. Uh, you know, they're, they're moving into uh, roles in different industry uh, and they're obviously in terms of uh, SEC mobilization. So from uh, the lower rung, they have moved on to uh, higher rung. So that's absolutely that's right. true, absolutely true. Uh, coming back, uh, you know, I do notice that the way a presentation is done on Sky, there's a bit of multicultural edge to it now. Uh, and uh, I believe that you have been responsible for some of those changes. I even heard some uh, ads being played out in Hindi, like Sky promotional ads in Hindustani. So uh, what do you think, you know, what has made this difference? I mean, Sky was as English as you get it, like it was uh, stuck in the old, uh, old boys, 
uh, network. So do you think you've kind of been able to crack that? I think, I think uh, any, any successful organization uh, needs to adapt itself uh, and, and, and uh, also uh, make itself a bit more agile and listen to uh, the customers, right? At Sky, like I said, we take diversity and inclusion very seriously. Uh, and what we are trying to do is demonstrate that by doing actions at our own end rather than waiting for somebody else to take those actions. So yes, you're right. Uh, we've had, we broke uh, the, the glass ceilings of Sky Sports 30-year uh, uh, history by airing ads in Hindi uh, during the linear feed of Sky Sports. Uh, we also ran promo smart campaigns uh, when um, the Indian cricket team came to tour India. Um, and and these, are, these are the various milestones. Uh, slowly but steadily, we are trying to make a difference and make ourselves more culturally relevant as a brand. So when you speak to anybody who comes from an ethnic background, we want them to love Sky uh, for what we offer and for uh, them to respect what we as an organization are doing um, in, in, in terms of making ourselves more culturally relevant to them, mm -hmm. uh, because the name of the game is uh, to be culturally relevant or be obsolete. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if you don't adapt, if you don't learn, if you are not flexible, uh, given the huge uh, strides that you know technology and other related uh, companies are making, uh, there is a chance of you falling by the wayside. And and at Sky. Uh, we don't believe in falling by the wayside. We believe in, 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 in striving to be the best and being at the top and uh, making ourselves, like you said, a bit more culturally relevant, attuned with the audiences, attuned to what the general public, uh, and when I say general public, I'm referring to also the 14% Britain's ethnic population, which yep. is according to the 2011 census in 20. 2021 census probably the numbers are going to be far bigger mm -hmm. uh but yeah we need to be prepared uh and and for that so yeah yeah that's where we are no that's great because it truly ref needs to reflect the multicultural representation of united kingdom so i'm yes. glad that sky is listening to you and they're doing this uh, what has been your role with cricket? I mean, you talked about IPL. Uh, so I've seen a number of uh, sporting, international sporting events coming on Sky. Uh, IPL is definitely one of them, uh, which is hugely yeah. successful. Uh, we just uh, had uh, last week, we had the, uh, last week or was it this week, we had the grand finale and it was again, one of the very successful uh, events uh, for Sky in terms of garnering yeah. viewers. Uh, and also believe that you've been instrumental in getting things like Kabaddi, which uh, is a very distinctly South Asian game. Uh, not many people know Kabaddi outside uh, South Asia. So you, you managed to get that on Sky. Uh, so yeah. what has been your role? I mean, what, what is your motivation and where do you think Sky is going in terms of international sporting events? See, just because I work at Sky doesn't mean that I cease to be a consumer of Sky. Uh, I, think, I think it's very important for me uh, to be able to uh, put towards the management as to what I as a consumer do feel. And uh, I have long felt that uh, the ads that we are showing on television, again, mm -hmm. are not probably better reflective of society. And uh, But that's also a challenge because you need to make your content mm -hmm. also uh, very culturally relevant to get your message um, uh, onto, onto the right place. So. Uh, this time around during the IPL, uh, we had, you know, diverse advertisers, whether that was an elephant atta with a kid talking about, you know, vitamin D uh, being present in elephant atta, or whether that was, um, you know, Western Union uh, talking about, you know, transferring money, uh, or whether that was... Um, uh, ICICI Bank talking about you know how it's uh, it's so easy to uh, you know get bank loans or to, you know to, to to for for property and so on and so forth. I think it it was our duty to showcase the content, but also have relevant advertisers come onto that mix because it it, it just shows that uh, when you have got advertisers and and believe you me the recall level is through the roof I, uh, the ipl has been a huge success for us with some mind-blowing stats 
uh, on a channel that is also very heavily male skewed. Uh, we had a huge upswing of female viewers um, of Sky Sports Cricket during the IPL. And uh, yeah, it, it leaves us a lot, uh, lot happy uh, with, with what we have achieved. And uh, like we said, we want to give as much as we can uh, possible uh, forums or uh, entertainment opportunities where we can have those specific culturally relevant ads being served to the communities that they can better relate to uh, than any other uh, entertainment medium that exists. No, absolutely, because absolutely. I do uh, kind of, uh, I did hear from ICIC Bank, once they started advertising on IPL, uh, their customers were calling in uh, saying that, oh, we've never seen you uh, ever before on Sky. So yes, it yeah. definitely does make that difference. Uh, so Dabashi, coming back to a very fundamental question, and this has been playing on in my mind, and I would love to know, uh, you know your views on this. We all know that we're going through this cataclysmic change in the media industry where uh, the format is continuously changing. Uh, there, there's a huge question mark on the future of television as we see now, uh, because he, currently we can see that everyone is able to live stream. You don't need to be beamed through a satellite or directly into uh, a Sky EPG. There are various ways you can watch things on your internet. Uh, and as we go forward, I mean, things might even become uh, more, uh, you know, it might become even uh, as simple as possibly creating some kind of app from where, you know, things can be beamed. So we go, we're going through all this, and obviously the huge success of OTT platforms like Netflix, Hotstar from the Indian side, uh, and I believe there are even, uh, you know, uh, very uh, successful Bengali apps as well uh, who are broadcasting, uh, you know, content from there. And it's just generally the trend all over the world. Uh, so where do you think we're going? I mean, do you think the future of television in the current format, or do you think it will kind of, um, uh, it will change, and uh, then uh, what are the pros and cons? I mean, you know, where are we going? Where are we heading? Uh, interesting question. Uh, but I think this is where, as broadcasters, as entertainment companies, we also have to up our game. And, and not be uh, complacent. So, I, you know, I don't know if you've seen our latest Sky Q uh, mm -hmm. campaign, yep. but uh, you know, everything in one place. Mm -hmm. So, what we are trying to do is, as as an organization, we are trying to make it far more easier for our audiences to consume our content in whatever way, shape, or form that they want to consume that content. Whether that's through linear television, whether that's through Ward, whether that's through online offering, or, or, or the works. Uh, in terms of, if you were to take a look at just, you know, plain streaming, uh, we've got Now TV, uh, which is again one of our outfits, uh, which is catering to a separate niche altogether. <laughs> and of course, you've got, you know, SkyQ, right, for for homes that uh, do want to have that level of various opportunities of watching different forms of content. We are also showing Netflix as part of the basic pack of Sky. So anybody who wants to watch streaming can still watch streaming, but at the same time, you know, when they want to watch news or sports, they are still within the, the Sky ecosystem. So I think it's interesting. Um, yes, cord cutting is quite prevalent in the US, uh, but US is a very big market, you know, and, and, and it's, it's a very, uh, how do I put it, in, in terms of density or condensation of particular you know, uh, network providers or homes, uh, the U.S. is very disparate. So I think the costs become very high or prohibitively expensive, and that's where probably your cord cutting is on a on a far uh, faster pace uh, than you would see it over here. But then again, we have made SkyQ itself so compelling that people do want to uh, stick to mm -hmm. the Sky platform and and do want to. Uh, continue watching Sky and at the same time probably having a top up uh, with, uh, you know, a couple of probably the OTT providers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that uh, there's going to be a death of television because people still do watch stuff. People do mm -hmm. still do watch uh, a lot of content and, uh, you know, just uh, writing it off, I don't think 
uh, would be uh, the right thing to do at this particular moment in time. But yes, uh, I think everybody needs to be on guard and adapt themselves. And like I said, keep themselves more relevant uh, to the changing audience taste. Mm -hmm. And uh, even streaming, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a limit, right, of the number of OTT apps that you're going to be uh, subscribing to. Because the reason why certain OTT apps became successful compared to the others was A, the costs were not that high. Uh, and also the flexibility of not having a long drawn up contract, right? But today, if you were to ask me that, yes, uh, you get a little bit of X amount of entertainment from this particular streaming site that costs 12 pounds, 15 pounds, whatever, seven pounds from the other one, eight pounds from the other one, five pounds from the other one. At the end of the day, when you take a look at your probable bill, if you find that you're spending about 50 or 60 pounds on just streaming content, uh, and that too, minus, uh, minus news probably, and minus live sport, uh, you suddenly wonder, mm, uh, maybe that's not a very uh, sensible thing to do, right? Uh, and, and, and then you will you know, zero in on back to what, what you were used to. Uh, because that gives you uh, the best of everything. So uh, there are quite a few considerations that you've got to keep in mind. And like we said, yes, uh, there is there is a lot of entertainment stuff that that is going around. But each each platform has its own strength, and and we would rather capitalize on our strengths that we have. Sure. I mean, you know, the huge diversity of content on Sky itself is a is a big seller because, uh, you know, I was on my way uh, in the I was having a chat with the Uber driver and he did say he would uh, always have Sky because he, that's the only one where he manages to uh, see the channels from his own country, you know, at the flick of a button. So, yeah, of course, the diversity would make a, a big playoff as well. Uh, coming yeah. back to, uh, you know, an important uh, announcement which came into the news two days back, and that was to do with, uh, you know, this is a big development in South Asia, but it's not just about India or South Asia. I think this will be reflective of how the governments uh, all over the world start looking at OTT content. I mean, the Indian government uh, has decided to put uh, the Indian in Information and Broadcasting Ministry at the helm of affairs for all OTT and digital content. So, so far yeah. we had, uh, you know, a free play. Uh, everyone was able to put, without any censorship, content on digital uh, and on OTT. And they, uh, you know, you had uh, uncensored stuff like Mirzapur, which you must have heard of, uh, or even a uh, lot more kind of, you know, uh, a lot more different kind of content, which was very, which was unheard of in India. You had sacred games, you had content which was a lot more revealing, uh, sexually explicit, had uh, all kinds of efforts. Uh, so with this move, I think there might be censorship or that might be what the government might be aiming, which is good and bad because it will be bad for the freedom. Uh, and again, you'll be, you know, the government will try to control in its own ways uh, what they want people to see. What are your views? And do you think uh, that's, that's something which is uh, acceptable in today's time? Well, I think, uh, what's your definition of freedom, right, is, is the first question. And, uh, that that's 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 a more fundamental question and along with that i think is it a level playing field is my second question because if you have let's say an entertainment industry that has got manifestation of that entertainment through various platforms uh, which can be you know uh, cinema in the theaters radio television OTT, online, uh, and if there is no level playing field in terms of rules, regulation, censorship, content, then it's not fair for any of those parties concerned because it feels like the person who gets away scot-free can do anything and get away with it, uh, whilst the others have got to bear the brunt of adhering to various rules, protocols, taxes, uh, and what have you. So I think if there is a way or a mechanism where 
there is a commonsensical approach to uh, freedom of expression and a commonsensical approach to uh, having the same level of level playing field across various platforms so that you're not advantaging somebody else or disadvantage or putting somebody else at a dis disadvantage. Uh, I think that would be a good thing for the overall industry because the reason why, and also cost probably, uh, because there are certain things uh, that I think India, again, television is cannot be written off because I think it's like, what was that beer ad, right? Uh, Budweiser or something that says refreshes the parts that other beers can't reach. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the same case with, uh, with television in India because television in India reaches probably what 99% of the overall population uh, through whatever messaging that you're doing. And uh, I don't think any of the OTT providers uh, would even remotely hit that number in terms of reach. Uh, I think it's a very city, top tier town uh, centric fad. But the content, uh, you've got to make sure that anybody who's under a certain age doesn't come across that content and what what they shouldn't uh, because there has been no uh, certification. Uh, you know, unlike a cinema where, I mean, I think Manish, you and I have grown up watching cinema where, you know, our parents never took us for films uh, that had uh, CBFC certification of A because it said adults, right? Yeah. So <laughs> we, 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 we were never exposed to those kind of films when we were growing up. Uh, and I think that's, that's the same case here uh, in, in this particular context because unless you have got user profiles, and I think you know, some of the OTT providers have started specific user profiles now, but before it was open for all. So yes, you're watching a Peppa Pig, but then you're also watching a Pata Lok, and God forbid, you don't want <laughs> cross wires to happen where you know somebody else no. switches on something. No. And, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad Debashi, you said common sensical approach because that's what is missing. Uh, and uh, the, the, the wrong side of it comes to its, uh, you know, controlling content, uh, especially yeah. in the South Asian context, it can be critical because then it leads to censorship of a certain kind. Uh, yeah. While we have in Britain, uh, you know, a very, uh, very, very liberal policy towards censorship, and it's very transparent. Uh, when in other parts of the world, it can translate into uh, some kind of political or ideological censorship. So that's where, uh, you know, uh, what you're expressing, I fully understand. But somewhere, uh, the institutions who are doing it have to be fully cognizant that it doesn't lead to even further censorship, which these countries already face. Uh, the Bashi, yeah. we're coming towards the end of the show. Uh, my last question to you, I mean, last two questions rather, I mean, we have uh, very little time, uh, but I would like to know uh, what's your vision uh, going forward uh, and uh, in terms of your career and in terms of your role uh, as being part of this uh, cultural uh, industry, which is actually cross-cultural, you kind of representative of two of the very uh, kind of, you know, diverse cultures. Uh, and what's your vision? Where do you think we're going? Yeah, I, I feel myself to be quite fortunate to be working for an organization at Sky, uh, because uh, not only I head the multicultural business, but I'm also the co-chair of Multiculture at Sky, which is our employee-driven network. And I've also got an international hat where I represent Sky's interest in markets of Asia as well as uh, Africa. Uh, so I've got I've got multi pronged role in 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 all of this, and I think uh, the events uh, uh, that happened during the summer have been a wake up call for organizations in the West uh, to introspect and uh, and take a deep look at themselves and see the makeup uh, of their organizations and also see whether they are catering to uh, one and all. Uh, rather than a specific uh, niche group uh, by being oblivious to the existence of other uh, communities. Thank so you. I feel quite privileged to also be able to help uh, uh, or be a facilitator in, in making that change across our wider organization. And, and, and some great work is, is being done right now. In fact, at Sky, we have also just yesterday the announcement was made 
of the hiring of a new chief talent uh, diversity and inclusion officer uh, whose mandate is going to make sure uh, as Thanks. to how Thanks, as Sky is going to be future. So, unfortunately, so, we're yeah. out of time. But thank you so much for being here. And it's so informative and pleasant to talk to you. There's lots happening in our industry, uh, and particularly at Sky. I mean, you know, you, you are representing the aspirations of millions of uh, people in this country. Uh, and it's, it's a very important job which you're doing. Uh, what you rightly said, the BLM movement has been a wake-up call for everyone in this industry. Uh, so thanks for being here, and I hope to see you again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you. See you. See you.